After Rob left, I sat for a long time thinking about his parting comment to me. He called me a wuss. Boy, that pissed me off. I could be anything, an asshole or stubborn, but a wuss. Never. As time passed, I calmed down and realized that Rob had good intentions, and the reason for his outburst was probably his frustration with me. In the end, we debated for almost an hour and accomplished absolutely nothing. Rob kept reminding me that Jenny didn't go to bed with Craig, and I kept telling him that it didn't matter to me. The problem I had with Jenny, which Rob didn't understand, is that there are several ways to be unfaithful. One dictionary definition of infidelity is a lack of loyalty or faithfulness. The bottom line for me was that Jenny was unfaithful to our marriage. Oh sure, she wasn't having sex with a guy, but she was intentionally dating ten times in three weeks with a man who wasn't her husband, and most of those encounters were when her husband was out of town. I'd even seen her with Craig once and thought nothing of it because I couldn't imagine her ever doing what she did. The last time I saw her, she told me that she had tricked Craig, kept seeing him while she worked out her plan to make me jealous. Three weeks later, she canceled it because she couldn't figure out how to make it work. You might think that confession would have worked in her favor, but to me, it meant that if things had worked out differently, if she had been able to come up with a workable plan, she would have continued to date Craig and that was something I couldn't forget. I had to believe that if things had worked out well, she would have kept him tied up as long as he fit into her plans. How she would have handled the request to go up to his room, I have no idea, but I firmly believe she would have found a way. Jenny is resourceful. Given that Craig's arrest by the FBI was imminent at the time, she probably would have been at the center of things too. Wouldn't that have been embarrassing? What really disappoints me is that Jenny actually thought that her seeing another man and trying to make me jealous was a good idea. That doesn't mean we didn't discuss our feelings about marital fidelity before we got married. Heck, we discussed it to death before we specifically wrote into our prenuptial agreement how we would divide our assets if one party wanted to end the marriage rather than go behind the other person's back. I made it very clear that there would be no second chances and Jenny expressed the same sentiments. During our marriage, there could not have been two people who were closer to us on this issue. The first time Jenny felt that I was inappropriate for my half of the marriage, she spoke to me about it as she should have. I don't know if it was because I had reverted to old habits, at least in her eyes, or if she misinterpreted my reaction to that first time I saw Jenny with that slug. Whatever it was, Jenny actually thought messing with Jerry Craig was a good idea. Not only had she made a bad decision from the start, but her choice of tool couldn't have been worse. When she got home that Wednesday night, she told me that she thought Craig was a jerk, and I completely agreed with that assessment. I believe that when you are a basically good person, you project some of that onto the other person. I firmly believe that Jenny never thought Craig would lie about their relationship and she was probably as devastated as I was when she first heard those rumors. What Jenny also forgot was her warning to me before we were married about inappropriate behavior in front of her staff and how it would damage her reputation. I don't think it ever occurred to her to damage my reputation. As Shakespeare said in Julius Caesar, Caesar's wife should be above suspicion. My staff looked down at me, and the realization that my men not only knew of her activities with Craig, but some of them had actually witnessed some of their encounters, infuriated me. How was I supposed to face my people? I guess it didn't matter to Jenny as long as she made me jealous. When you think about it, I suppose it would have been hard for her to make me jealous if she had picked a man I didn't know, but by picking one of my employees who had no character at all, she made sure that everyone in my company knew that he was secretly dating my wife. Once Craig finished telling all the guys that he was having the boss's wife while the dumb bastard was out of town, I'm sure by the end of the day everyone in the office knew. If it hadn't been for Rod's courage in coming to me and the woman who talked to Rob, I wonder if I would have ever found out. I did feel sorry for Rod that day. He was quite young and all, but he felt so bad about what was being done to me that he couldn't keep quiet. You have to admire that kind of devotion. People sometimes forget that perception is everything. It doesn't really matter that Jenny didn't have sex with Craig. Everyone who heard the rumor believed it, so why not?
After all, what married woman meets another man for lunches and dinners with dancing afterward while her husband is out of town, if nothing is going on between them? I know I certainly wouldn't, and I wouldn't do it. Even now, after seeing the black and white FBI report, I find it hard to believe that asterisk nothing asterisk happened. As the old saying goes, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck. I don't blame Jenny for the assumptions she made. I might have made them too, given the facts as she saw them. What I do blame Jenny for is her solution to the problem. Her solution destroyed my trust in her, and I just can't ignore that. I have seen firsthand what can happen when trust disappears in a marriage. My dad wanted so badly to believe that his wife was sorry, and it was just sex and all that, that he tolerated her cheating over and over until I intervened and he was forced to choose between me and his whore wife. I absolutely refused to be used like that. I had five good years with Jenny, and while I will miss her dearly, I will get over it. The next morning I decided it was time to meet Jenny and settle things once and for all. I got in my car and took the long drive back to Atlanta. Arriving late, I checked into a local hotel near my office. I ordered a sandwich for the room and went to bed. I slept surprisingly well, all things considered. I contemplated going to the office but decided against it. Rob was doing a great job of running things, and my future plans included weaning myself off the business anyway. So why make things harder for him? Who knows? Maybe I'll become a beach bum and live off my investment when I get back from vacation. I picked up the phone and called Jenny at work. I told her I wanted to meet with her and talk things over. She wanted me to come home, but I immediately declined. I didn't want her to get the wrong impression, and meeting at home would do that. Eventually, we agreed to meet at Rob and Diane's place, mostly on neutral ground. I told Jenny that I would talk to Rob and get back to her. Rob, of course, agreed. He was probably hoping we would get back together. I won't bore you to death recounting everything, but suffice it to say that in the end, nothing Jenny said made much difference. I believe she was truly sorry for what she had done, and I forgave her. Just because I couldn't stay married to her didn't mean I didn't love her. We all make mistakes and deserve to be forgiven. The next day, I met with Rob in my office and laid out my plans for the future. I made him president and CEO and turned over the day-to-day -day operations of the business to him. I was planning to go on a world cruise the next day, and I wanted everyone in my company to know who was in charge. Rob was stunned, to say the least, but vowed to do his best in my absence. I had no qualms about that at all, or I wouldn't have handed him the business in the first place. We shook hands, and he told me how sorry he was that things had turned out differently, but he also knew it was best not to try to change my mind. I walked out of the office, said goodbye to all my people, thanking them for all their hard work, and with a smile on my face, drove back to the hotel to pack for my trip. I was sitting on the porch of our dream cabin, looking at the mountains in the distance, when my wife came out with lemonade. She poured two glasses, handed one to me, then sat down in the chair next to me. I held her hand and looked into her eyes. She smiled back, then leaned over to where we kissed. Reluctantly breaking the kiss, I sighed, thinking about how lucky I was. I had the most wonderful woman in the world as my wife. I ran a very successful company that had doubled in size in the last 10 years, and we had our dream vacation home. This weekend, my parents were watching our two kids so my wife and I could have some alone time, if you know what I mean. What are you thinking about? My wife asked. Just how lucky I am. How lucky we are, really. We've done everything right for ourselves, and I'm very grateful for every bit of it. I know what you mean, but I can't help but think about. So, Diane, you know we've already discussed this. We did the best we could, but sometimes you just have to accept things as they are. I closed my eyes, remembering how many times Diane and I had tried to change Ted's mind about Jenny. I know, but I still feel bad. We're living in the little house he built for Jenny, and she hasn't even seen it, Diana said sadly. Sab we used to invite her here for family weekends and holidays, but she always turned us down. I'm glad Ted sold us the place, but I wish it didn't bring back so many bad memories for Jenny. She works too hard. You know she deserves a vacation, and this would be the perfect place to relax. Diane was right. Jenny was working too hard. After her marriage to Ted fell apart, 
she went head over heels in her work and became the youngest company president and then the youngest CEO her company had ever had. Her company is thriving, but I wonder about the cost. She paid a very high price for such a minor transgression. Over the years, I have been able to get Ted to talk to me and explain his train of thought regarding his treatment of Jenny. I love my sister, and I love Ted, and I tried my best to keep them together even years after the divorce was finalized. I think Ted finally told me about his childhood and his father, so I would shut up and leave him alone. In some twisted way, I understand where he's coming from, although I definitely don't agree with his decision. I think Ted was deeply traumatized by what he heard and saw when his stepmother cheated on his father and brought her lovers into their home. I almost cried when he told me about the depths of depression his father went through when his wife horned him in his own bed. I heard the rage in his voice as he repeated his vow to never let a woman treat him like that. I felt so sorry for him that I stopped my attempts to set him up with Jenny again. I knew that once he made his decision, there was no changing it. That's just the way Ted is in his business relationships and in his personal life. He felt he was doing what was right for him, and he was the one who had to live with the consequences. If hell exists, Ted's stepmother will have a lot to pay for. She ruined one man's life, driving him to an early grave. She turned a beautiful, loving man into an obsessed man who refused to give his wife a second chance after she made a stupid mistake. And worst of all, at least for me, her influence on Ted and his influence on their marriage turned my sister into a workaholic who refused to try to date anyone again. She told me that she had lost the love of her life and wasn't going to waste her time trying to find what she had lost. Oh, yeah. That woman is going to have a lot to pay for, and I hope she rots in hell. By the way, I still think Ted is a wuss.